How much is enough? That seems to be the question of the passage that Carl just read for us. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 4 through 12. That's where we will be all the morning this morning. So if you haven't already, please open there. How much is enough? For John D. Rockefeller, the answer was always just a little bit more. At the peak of his wealth, Rockefeller had a net worth of about 1% of the entire U.S. economy. He owned 90% of all the oil and gas industry of his time. Compared to today's rich guys like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, uh, Rockefeller made them look like beggars. Yet one day, Rockefeller was asked which of his many millions was his favorite, to which he responded by saying, my next one. <laughs> Rockefeller, richer than any likely man that has ever been, except not named Solomon. He was richer than any man, yet his riches were never enough. John Rockefeller's estimated net worth in 1937 of $1.4 billion would translate in his day to 1.5% of all U.S. GDP and make him the richest man American, America has ever known, yet it was never enough. And yet he still wanted just a little bit more. And so this morning, as we begin our study, as we look at another topic that Solomon searched in meaning, searched for meaning in, which is riches, wealth, and toil, and work, we must understand that before you can know how much is enough, you've got to define enough. You've got to know that enough isn't just an amount, but enough is an attitude. Journalist Brian Moore reminds us that money is a wonderful tool, but it makes a terrible tyrant. And therein lies the difference. What is it that you want out of money? What is it that you want out of your toil? What is it that you want out of your work? What is it that you want about life? What is your attitude about all these things? And as we look at the entire study of Ecclesiastes and the book that it is, where are you searching for your satisfaction? How much and who is it that holds enough? That's the question of our morning. This morning, Solomon reminds us that all you really need is the God who has set you free. Solomon reminds us that enough is Christ. Solomon reminds us that enough is Jesus. Solomon reminds us that enough is the table that is set before us by Christ. This table of grace and sustenance that we have nothing to do with preparing, yet it satisfies like no other table. Today, Solomon turns our attention to another area of life that does not and will not satisfy. The NIV that Carl read for us, it translates this as toil and achievement. The NASB goes with labor and skill. The King James travail and right work, while Eugene Peterson in the message lands on work and ambition. There are all, these are all different ways of saying the same thing. Pride and envy will always leave you empty. Solomon points out, beginning in verse 4 of chapter 4, he says that all I saw, all, I saw all the toil and achievement, they sprang from one person's envy of another. And he says this too is meaningless. This too is a chasing after the wind. What does Solomon begin our passage of study with today? Here he begins by pointing out the root of all of the world's toil, all of our worldly achieving, all of our worldly striving apart from God. He says it's envy. He says it's a malice heart. It's a coveting heart and it's our lusting eyes. Lusting eyes over the achievements and possessions of our neighbors. The achievements and possessions of our friends. The achievements and possessions of those that we go to church with. Of our family and loved ones. It's coveting the things of another. That is the root of the world's striving that Solomon rightly points out here. Back in 1913, author Moman created a comic that perfectly illustrates what Solomon is talking about. If you're not familiar with the comic strip, you are certainly familiar with the idiom that it spawned. The comic strip is called Keeping Up with the Joneses. And throughout the run of the comic strip, a couple, the Smiths, they go to great, often comical, and most often dis uh, great lengths with disastrous com consequences to keep up with the Joneses, to keep up with the Jones family who happens to be their neighbors. They want to do the things that they do. They want to achieve the things that they achieve. They want to get the things that they get to live the life that they live. 
The comic strip is all about keeping up with their neighbors, the Joneses. But as I researched this comic strip, one thing stood out to me. The Joneses, the family that the Smiths are attempting to keep up with, they're never even pictured in the strip. They're mentioned over and over by the Smiths, and their things are often pursued by the Smiths. But it's not a case of the Joneses taunting the Smiths with their things, toys, and achievements. No, that's not the root of the Smiths' attempts to keep up with the Joneses. It's not something from outside of them. No, the root of the Smiths' attempts to keep up is entirely from within them. The root of their striving after the Joneses is, is entirely their own pride and envy, their own coveted, covetous eyes. My question for us this morning as we begin this message, challenging to ask ourselves how much and what is enough. This passage of Scripture that challenges us to look for, within and answer honestly as guided by the Holy Spirit, what and how much is enough. This question of how much of our striving is coming from our envy. How much of our toiling stems from our lustful eyes. How much of our work comes from our own pride and ego and our desire to stroke them. Solomon says to us as one who has searched the world over for meaning and work and toil, he says as one who himself has toiled and labored more than anyone who has come before him or anyone who has come after him, he says it all springs from our envy of another. Think of the example the Word of God gives us of the life of Joseph. A man who experienced plenty and much. Yet at one point in his life, he ends up having it all taken away because of his brother's pride and selfish ambition. But even when Joseph has all taken away from him, Joseph goes back to work. But what is the key that I want us to see? What is the key that takes our work and our toil away from selfish ambition and pride and to doing the work for God? Working in a godly manner, and that is simply working with and for God. It's working with God as your guiding and shining light. And we know Joseph went to the top again, and he was put over everyone except Pharaoh himself. He worked, and he worked for the Lord, only to have everything taken again from him, not because of anything he did, but because of the fact that he feared the Lord. Yet Joseph, in a literal prison cell, again, he continues and to work and serve the Lord. And as the Lord is to each and every one of us, the Lord is gracious to Joseph again. What I want us to see here is work is a good thing. Toil and labor is a good gift from God. Remember Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Remember, work and toil in and of themselves, they are not a curse of the fall. Remember the curse of the fall, the curse of sin, the curse of our rebellion against God when it comes to our work is not that we have to work, it's that our work without God is meaningless. It's that our work without God is now empty. It's that our work without God, it may give us some fruit today, but that fruit will always be gone tomorrow. Now our work becomes tainted with our pride, with our sin, and because of our ego. One last thing before we move on. As I've studied Ecclesiastes, I've mentioned it here before, but I've been amazed at the way that Solomon has clearly read, read the book of Genesis and clearly alludes to its realities. After the fall, what is the first moment in history that the Bible accounts for? The life of Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, and their work and how it became afflicted with sin, ego, and pride. Abel does what we are all called to do, which is to bring simply the best of all that we have, including our work and our striving, to bring the best of whatever we might have and to bring it before the Lord. To bring our first fruits as the Word of God brings it, puts it to God. Yet Abel, Cain's, or Abel because of his, or Cain, I should say, because of his own desire to get ahead, he holds back his first fruits. And God calls him on it. What does Cain do? Well, he continues not to live out his fear of God, but he lives out his envy of others. In this case, his brother, and he kills his brother. It is not, it was never supposed to be this way. 
work is a good gift from God when used in submission and in reverence to God. When used not ultimately to get ourselves ahead, but used ultimately to advance the kingdom of God, work is a wonderful thing, but when it is used for our own exaltation, it is truly a deadly thing. The life of Cain and Abel reminds us of that. The book of James reminded us of that. And the book of, and of Ecclesiastes reminds us of that as well. Pride and envy will always leave you empty. And idleness will never bring you happiness. Solomon continues in verse 5 where he says, Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Solomon here switches gears and he begins to speak to us in Proverbs. Fools fold their hands, he says, and ruin themselves. What does that mean? Simply this. Solomon says elsewhere in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 5, He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during the harvest is a disgraceful son. The Gospel of Matthew records Jesus' thoughts on the harvest in Matthew 9, starting in verse 35, where Matthew writes, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, they are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Brothers and sisters, there is a harvest outside of these doors that is bountiful. There is a harvest outside of these doors that is plentiful. The harvest, of course, that we speak of is the harvest for the kingdom of God. It is a harvest of this lost, searching, and longing world. Individuals who are looking for something that will truly satisfy, for something that will truly last. Like Solomon, it is a harvest of those individuals finding that satisfaction that only comes through Jesus Christ. The harvest is a world of sinners being saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. It is a world having their sins washed by the blood of Jesus Christ and becoming white as snow. That harvest is individuals being able to take out and reach out and take of the bread of Christ and know that when they eat of Christ, they eat of something that will truly satisfy and that will last. The harvest that is plentiful is one more sinner being yanked from the clutches of hell, from an eternity in hell, and instead being in a, in, given an eternity with Jesus, which we know an eternity with Jesus is heaven. That harvest that is plentiful awaits us. That harvest is plentiful, yet the problem Jesus points out in Matthew, and the problem that has plagued the church for 2,000 years since Jesus spoke these words, is the workers are few. The workers to take in this harvest are few. The laborers for this harvest are not many in number. For our purposes today, I want us to see as individuals and as Peckway Church, the first step in our adding workers to that harvest is, is not our putting hand to plow. At least not our putting hand to plow in the sense that we think of putting hand to plow. Jesus says to us in verse 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Brothers and sisters, as those who have tasted and seen how good the Lord is, as those who are assured of the salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ and only comes by the way of the cross of Calvary, as those who rightfully desire to see all those that we love and those that we have never met taste and see of how good our good God is, the first step in that is not a program. The first step in that is not an evangelism method, it's not a worship style, it's not a preacher, and it's not an outreach. Our first step is to pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest send out more laborers into his harvest. This, the kingdom of God, is all his harvest, and we must pray to be a part of it. We must pray that the Lord of the harvest would give us more workers for his harvest and his work. And Jesus tells us that we must pray earnestly, meaning with passion, with fervor. We must earnestly seek the Lord of the harvest provision of workers for the harvest. We can fold our hands in this life in two different ways. We can fold our hands, as Solomon speaks about, and do nothing. 
We can fold our hands and say, well, things can't get any worse, all while knowing as God's people that we know the way that we can actually make things better. We can fold our hands and do nothing, or we can fold our hands to pray. We can come before our Father's throne of grace in Jesus, knowing, knowing that He is bringing our petitions before the Father, and we can plead with God to simply be the God that we know that He already is. The good God that desires all people to be saved. Will we put in the work of prayer? Will we seek the kingdom of God above all else, or will we fold our hands and say, well, at least I am saved? Pride and envy will always leave you empty. Folded hands will always be empty hands. And with God, just enough is truly good enough. Solomon continue, continues in verse 6 by saying, Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil. This too is a chasing after the wind. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. What does that mean for, that, for, mean for us? I believe it is this. Much like cotton candy that we may have enjoyed this week at the fair, we are able to partake in, we are able to reach our hand into the bag of life and take out whatever it is that we want. God gives us the free will to take as many handfuls of life and all that life offers as we want. I mean, remember Eden. God created us and God created all and it was good, but God did not cage his good creation. He gave Adam and Eve, just like us, free reign to take a bite out of whatever apple that we desire. It's amusing to me though, when people say that God and religion and the church, that they are out to control you. God literally gives us freedom to do whatever it is that we want. God gives his good creation more freedom than, say, the government gives us. God has literally one simple request of his creation. And it is a good request. It is truly what is best for us. He has one request of those that are under his care. And that request can be summed up in one simple sentence. That request is to love him with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind. And then to love our neighbors simply as we already love ourselves. We, as Solomon has already pointed out for us today, we are great. We are experts. We are pros at loving ourselves. The challenge comes in loving God and loving others in the same way. Solomon says to us, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls that come from toil. When it comes to our passage of study today, this morning, are you sitting here looking for a return on life? This morning, are you sitting here looking for a true return on life? On your toil? Are you looking for something that you could reach your hand in through the bag and pull out something that will truly satisfy, something that will not vanish the moment that you partake of it, something that will truly satisfy? For Solomon, as one who has searched the world over, unlike anyone who has come before him or anyone after him, he answers the question like this it's simply keep God's commands and fear him. He says to us, sir, this is simply the duty of each and every one of us. There are many things that we can do with this life. God gives us the freedom to choose any one of them. However, the reality is only one will satisfy. Only one will bring you an eternal return. Only one will bring you eternal life. Only one will bring you a return that is beyond measure. It is resting in God. It's resting in the finished work of the cross. It's resting and eating of the table that has already been prepared for you. Do less. Trust God more. Remember that envy will always leave you empty. Remember that with God, just enough is good enough. Remember that idleness will always leave you with empty hands. And finally, remember that in partnership lies success. Solomon, starting in verse number 7, makes a point, and then he gives several proofs of his point. I'm actually going to read this section from the message paraphrase. There Solomon says, I turned my head and saw yet another wisp of smoke on its way to nothingness. I saw a solitary person, completely alone, no children, no family, no friends, yet working obsessively late into the night compulsively greedy for more and more, never bothering to ask, why am I working like a dog? Why am I never having any fun? And who cares? 
Solomon says this is more smoke. This is bad business. Then Solomon says it's better to have a partner than to go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. And then if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, tough. For two in bed, keep each other warm, but alone you shiver all night. Be yourself and leave yourself protected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope is not easily snapped. What I want us to see here is no matter what you have, it is always best for you and those around you to share it. It is best for those and yourselves to share what you have. We talk about this often. I believe we can quickly understand the benefits of serving and sharing for the church. Why it's better for the church that you would share all that you have with the church. Remember, what is a church? Simply, it is a body of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a building or a place. But the church is the ecclesia in the original language, which simply means it's a gathered people. It's a set-apart people. It's a distinct group of people. And of course, it is good for us. It is good for Peckway Church. It's good for the capital C church for its members to carry out its work. Otherwise, it would not be a church, but it would just simply be a, a place of more emptiness if we're not carrying out and serving and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that we can understand why it benefits the church for its members to be active members, but how does it benefit us? The week that I wrote this message, GCC was preparing for its annual women's worship night. Much like the men's ministry, it kicks off its fall season with a women's worship night to gather. And a part of that preparation for that night was setting up this arbor that you can see on the screen. But putting this arbor in its place was harder than it may have first appeared. Now this arbor, it's, it's not heavy. When we were moving it, it didn't even have those decorations upon it. This arbor was not heavy, yet it was hard to put into its place. Why was it hard to put in its place, and why did you need more, two, more than two people to do so? Well, because a guy by the name of Don Milan had carefully and meticulously crafted this photo opportunity to work just as it is working, to function just as it is functioning, to sit with just a slight curve and for its weight to sit exactly here, here, and here. And so anytime anyone would try to move those two, anytime two people would try to move this by simply picking it up by its end, it, it was never going to work. It was never going to function as it was designed to work. The work was certainly going to be slower and a lot harder than it sh should have been. Eventually, if you keep going with just two people on the ends carrying this load, the middle of the arbor is not going to be supported and eventually the arbor is going to come crashing down. It's really the same thing with the church. God has designed his church to function in a certain way, and you are a part of that function. You are a part of that design. I don't know if you are an end piece. I don't know if you are this piece. I don't know if you are that piece, but you are a part of God's design for the church. God is the one who has meticulously crafted you, and his church has designed a place for you within this church. A place for you to use your gifts in accordance with his wills and ways within his church. Listen, God designs each and every one of us with gifts and graces without exception. He gives each and every one of us the blessing to be able to use our gifts to his glory. But he does not force us to use our gifts to his glory. He gives us the free will to choose how we use our gifts. We can choose to use our gifts for our own selfish game as Solomon once tried and we are prone to do. We can choose to use our gifts to satisfy ourselves by ourselves. Or we can use them to satisfy ourselves in a way that will also satisfy this longing world. It is good and it is good for others when we work in partnership. It is good for the church when we work in partnership. But never forget that it is also good for us when we work in partnership as well. Here's a, some pictures from parade night. Wednesday night, some of us used our gifts to serve the Lord, and by the looks of everyone's face, it looks like they were miserable 
while they were doing it, right? It certainly seems like it was good for them to use their gifts, to use their time, to use their lives, to serve the Lord in this very unique way. The church is here to bring us joy. The church is here to bring us real and lasting happiness. Jesus Christ has prepared a table for all to sit around, to sit around and find freedom, to find real and everlasting joy. As Jesus sat and ate and drank with sinners, one of the, as one of, was one of the critiques of his ministry, I have a hard time picturing a somber and sad occasion. A somber and sad occasion sitting around a table with the God of endless joy. Picture the scene with me. Jesus in a room full of people. People gathered around the table after their long day of working and striving. All gathered around the table anxiously awaiting the first course of Martha's delicious cooking. Mary and others sitting at Jesus' feet soaking in the joy of his presence. Do you think for a moment that this room is filled with, with somber attitudes and a lack of of joy? Do you think that this room was not a place of, of happiness? Is Jesus' feet a place of longing and dissatisfaction? Is around the table of Christ a table that you will ever leave unsatisfied and unfulfilled? Of course not. Jesus is the God who brings the, out the good wine first. Jesus is the God who feeds the multitudes and then has some left over. Jesus is the God who prepares a meal for his followers after their long day of toiling on the, sh on the lake by the shore. Jesus is the God who looks deep into the eyes of death and sin and says to it, it is finished. Jesus is the God of immeasurably more than all we could ever begin to imagine or even much less ask, yet we so often turn to so many other unsatisfying things. One of them being our work. One of them being our toil. One of them being our attempts to set our own table. My prayer is that our prayer as a church and as individuals be that our hearts be completed, that our joy be completed in Christ. That our happiness, that our longings be fulfilled in the name of Jesus Christ. Because Christ has prepared a table for you as we turn our attention to the feast set before us by Christ that is the Lord's Supper. We can turn our attentions, and we should rightfully, as Carl has already mentioned in our prayer, we do so turning our attention to many things. For communion and the participation of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and His broken body, it's a multifaceted act. There are many facets to this table. We, of course, remember the blood of Christ that was shed to cover over our sin. We remember the broken body of Christ that was broken so that we could be made whole. We remember these things as we approach and partake of this table. And as we approach this table, we reflect on our sin. We reflect on our sin, not as a burden that we carry, but as a way that we can lay it down as we approach this table. Our time of communion is a time to ask God by His Holy Spirit to point out ways and areas of sin in our lives and for that same Spirit of God to give us all that we need to lay this sin down as we leave this table and be cleansed new by Christ. Communion is also a time of remembrance. A time to remember that through the blood that was shed, through His broken body, through the table that Christ has set before us, that all the saints that have gone before us, that all brothers and sisters around the world that are celebrating World Communion Day with us, that we are united with them and that all that will come after us that are united in the name of Jesus Christ, that we are united, that we are one in Christ. But today, in view of what we have spent this morning reflecting on, I ask that we remember and that we focus on the reminder that the work is completed in Christ. That in Christ the table has been set for you. That God has done truly what only God could do. Make the way that this unsatisfied and unsatisfying world may be satisfied eternally in Christ. That way has a name and it is Jesus Christ. What God has done through His Son is prepare a table for all who come to not only to just simply eat and drink, but to be satisfied. 
A table was set by God, loving the world so much that he sent his Son into the world to live and dwell amongst us in our flesh. To live as one, to live as one of us, fully human, yet also simultaneously fully God. To face every suffering and temptation that you have faced, even death itself. But yet, even in facing these trials and weaknesses, God still, Christ still remained perfect. He still, even in these temptations, remained sinless. He still remained divine. He still remained set apart. He still remained perfectly obedient to his heavenly Father. He lived the perfect life, but even in and of itself, the perfect life would not set us sinners free, and it would not render death defeated. The book of Hebrews reminds us that the perfect life needed to be laid down as the once and for all sacrifice for any and all sin. When the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those ceremonially unclean sanctifies them so that they are outwardly clean. But then it says, how much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God? How much more will that cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Jesus Christ laid down his life. He shed his blood. He did this on Good Friday to cover over your sins, no matter how great or how many those sins might be. But then three days later, Jesus picked that life up again so that you can have the assurance of knowing that if you live in Christ, your sins are forgiven and you have a new and eternal life in Christ. You have the assurance of knowing that while, yes, you are a sinner still in need of much grace, your gracious Savior is the God of immeasurably more grace than you could ever begin to dream. The table before us reminds us that in Jesus, our ultimate striving and our greatest need have been fulfilled and it's been completed in Christ. It reminds us that whom the Son sets free, they are truly free indeed. It reminds us that in Christ, we have a new and eternal life and we have life abundant. This table reminds us that while, yes, we are sinners that continually fall short of the glory of God, yet those that put their trust in Jesus Christ, the one who began a good work in you, he will bring that good work to completion. To which we say as we come to this table, thanks be to God. So in a moment, come, drink of the forgiveness of sins that is Jesus' blood, and knowing that the work is completed and is resurrected body. Come eat of his broken body, knowing that this was broken so that you could be made whole, and so that you could be filled again. And finally, not only as we approach this table, not stopping as we return to our seats and continuing as we leave this holy place and entering back into a longing world, ponder this question as guided by the Holy Spirit. How much more do I need? Our Savior says this starting in verse number 9 of John chapter 15. He says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's command and remained in His love. I have told you this so that, you may, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus has told you all these things. Jesus has done all these things. Jesus has set this table for you so that your joy may be complete. So that your joy, the joy in your life may be full. Listen, there's nothing wrong with work. And I pray that as you've seen today, work in and of itself and for the Lord is a good gift from God. And work within the church is a good thing. But as far as the Rockefeller way, as far as the American way, as far as the American dream, as far as our work that is rooted in our envy of others, Solomon points out today, how much more do you need? Solomon asked us, how much is enough? When will you reach the point where you open your eyes and see that Christ has made your joy complete already? That in Christ, the table that is set before you, you can come before it, eat of it, and have full confidence that the details of your life are under control by the good God that you come before. This morning, I invite you, come to the table and know that you can be full in Christ. 
You can be fooled by fearing Christ, by revering Christ, and by keeping His commands. This morning, come to this table and know that this is the simple duty of all mankind. To love God and to love others as yourself. To love others as you've already been loved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we ask that as we come to this table that you would prepare our hearts for this act of remembrance, for this act of reflection, for this act of weeding out of the sinful desires of our lives, Lord, whatever they may be, Lord, the act of weeding out anything that is not of you and your goodness, Lord. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work, that it would weed out as we come forward, as is the tradition in our evangelical congregational church, as we come forth to receive that which has been given to us by your Son. As we come forth to receive this good gift that is communion, as we come forth just as we are, but not staying as we are. As we come forth to be made new, to be renewed, to be cleansed of the sins that we have committed, Lord. So that we come forth renewing our minds so that we do not commit those sins in the future, Lord. We ask that your work will be done through the reading of your word, through the songs that we sing, through the prayers that we pray, through this act of remembrance that we will partake in, Lord, but most importantly, through the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord Jesus, we pray simply as we prepare our hearts to worship and to come forward to communion by singing Just As I Am in 269, Lord, we ask that you would do what only you could do, that you would prepare our hearts for worship and that you remind us that we have a Savior that has done abundantly more than we could ever begin to ask or imagine, Lord. Lord Jesus, prepare our hearts, make us clean, and help us leave this place more like your Son than when we entered it, Lord. For it's in your Son's name that we pray. At this time, I'll ask Andrew and Mary Jane and also William to come forth and lead us in a song that will continue to prepare our hearts for communion. Hymn number 269, Just As I Am. <laughs>